Everyone ready? Are we ready? Yeah. Right, ready go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the North Center School District. We are holding a public meeting budget forum this evening. Uh, this meeting was properly advertised. Uh, we are fortunate to have the majority of our school board with us this evening. Uh, we are going to run this much like one of our committee meetings. Uh, so that, uh, that we will uh, offer the opportunity for public comment for those people that are in attendance. We welcome everyone that's joining us via Zoom this evening. Uh, and really the whole purpose of this is, uh, uh, President Daniels, I wanna thank you for uh, really uh, asking the administration to put together a comprehensive uh, presentation tonight on our budget. Uh, not only our upcoming 2022-2023 budget that we're getting ready, uh, we now have a proposed final budget uh, that was approved and we're getting ready for final budget adoption, but also really what goes into the budgeting process of public schools. Um, you know, because for the for the uh, taxpayers at home, I uh, probably have a lot of questions of what goes into right now we're proposing in excess of $177 million to be spent on our educational program in the next fiscal year. Uh, and a lot goes into that. And uh, I want to thank our chief financial officer, Ms. Ann Work, and her team for putting together uh, taking the lead on tonight's presentation uh, that we hope will be educational and informative. Uh, but again, uh, we really want to educate not only the board, but our entire public that a lot goes into, uh, I hate to call it the business of education, but that's kind of really what we're talking about this evening. Um, thank you to the administrative team for all of your support uh, in not only developing the budget, but this process. Uh, so uh, Ms. Rourke, I'm going to turn it, uh, the presentation over to you. Uh, and again, we'll run it like a committee meeting, so there'll be an opportunity for public comment for our people that attend uh, in, uh, in person this evening. We'll do the presentation, but board members, uh, you can feel free because we'll run it like a committee to ask questions as we go along. Yes, so sir. with that, Ms. Work, good evening. Sure. So good evening. So welcome to Budget 101. Um, I will be honest with you up front and tell you it is a rather long presentation. I'll try to move through it quickly, but again, if you've got questions, please feel free to stop me along the way. We have a whole slew of topics to sort of talk, start um, the meeting by talking about Act 1, a little bit of background on um, Act 1, the changes it made to its budgeting uh, timetable, philosophies, guidelines, um, really changes the whole landscape of our budget process. We want to make sure everybody understands that. We're going to talk about what we identified as strategic goals and priorities for the 22-23 school year and 22-23 budget development. We're going to talk about broad-based, where we spend our money, where we get our money. Really going to spend a lot of time talking about our funding challenges, just so that everyone has a better idea of why, um, why we need more money, um, what we would do with more money, and why the challenges exist, especially for districts um, of our nature and our demographics. We're going to talk about where the 22-23 budget stands. We're very close to final adoption, and we want to talk about next steps. And then happy to answer questions. Um, starting it off by talking about Act One. Act One was um, enacted in 2006. It's also called the Property Tax Relief Act. It was amended in 2011. This is a law that initially legalized slot gambling in Pennsylvania. Um, it also grew the profits from the gambling. It expanded uh, rebate opportunities for senior citizens through the Pennsylvania Rent Rebate Program, and provided every homestead property in Pennsylvania with a credit on their tax bill. Um, so when you get your tax bill, if you are an owner-occupied residential property, you are eligible for homestead credit. More importantly, in my opinion, Act One really clamped down on the authority of local school boards, especially related to budget adoption, the authority to raise taxes and fund programs locally, and um, then it established a new budget timeline for budget process. When you talk about the homestead credit, um, for the 22-23 school year, the stats just came out last week. The Commonwealth Budget Secretary certified, you can see, in excess of $750 million. It's a very significant increase, I'll be honest with you. Our share jumped to a little over $3.4 million, which is up about $650,000. Um, these funds are distributed equally to all approved homestead properties. Again, those are owner-occupied residential units. There's a process you have to go through. Montgomery County oversees that process to actually is declared as a homestead property. The credit that will appear on your tax bill for the 22-23 school year is three, a little over $311. And here you can see that that is the first significant increase in many, many years. It had been hovering around $240 um, for the past five years. Um, so lots of 
you know, kind of opinions about why that significant increase and the significant bump. Um, honestly, don't know the truth. We're waiting for some answers from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Uh, but there's a significant number of people who feel that the online setting environment is contributing to the profitability of the system. Here, I want to talk for a minute about that kind of uh, limit on how much school boards can raise taxes by. Before Act 1, school boards could raise taxes as high as they wanted. Um, if you felt that there was you know, a 12% tax increase needed to fund the programs and staff in your community, the school board had the authority to do that. Act 1 really limited and clamped down on local authority. Um, it established benchmarks. So the benchmark is, the benchmark is called the Act 1 index. Um, so there's a base index, which is based on statewide wages and inflation, and then there's a and it's what's called an adjusted index um, for really districts that are struggling, I'll be honest with you, um, which makes not much sense if you'll see in a few slides. Most districts in Montgomery County are not assigned an adjusted Act 1 index, but in Orange County, because we're demographic and our population, we are assigned an adjusted index. And you know, here's kind of what I talk about, you know, the contradiction and the inequity that starts right out the gate. Um, we're going to talk about so many of these inequities tonight, challenges tonight. But you know, the the one that comes to mind when you're talking about this adjusted Act 1 index, it just seems such not to swear, <laughs> but it just it. Seems so unfair that they assign an adjusted index to districts they know are already struggling. So wealthier districts um, who can fund their own programs and don't need to raise taxes um, are afforded a lot more flexibility under the law. Act 1 acknowledges that it costs more to educate students in a district like ours, but rather than providing funding, it says, go ahead, tax your people a little bit. Go ahead, make it a little bit harder for them. Um, so again, just I think you are going to see that the deck is stacked against districts like ours. And just to while Ian's getting ready to go to the next slide, uh, pre Act One, where you, where she talks about that burden, and I, thanks to Ann and the team for putting this together. Here are the five years in 2000, 2001, we had a zero percent tax increase here in our show. The five years after that, pre Act One. 6.3, 9.9, 8 8.1, 6.6, 4.8% tax increases. In our district in those years. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, so in the five years, in, in the 2000, 2001 school year, uh, in our center school district had a 0% tax increase. In the five tax years before we got to act one, this school district enacted because again, we've been underfunded and we've had to do what we needed to do. Local tax increases, 6.3%, 9.9%, 8.1%, 6.6, 4.8. .6, You're welcome. Sure. Sorry for the people at home that I was screaming, I was getting agitated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're gonna hear a lot of that tonight, I'll be honest with you. So here is a historical look at the Act 1 Index in Montgomery County. Honestly, it, it's, it's difficult to see. Um, you can see it ranges from the 22-23 school year on the left, and then provides you the historical data over to the 2012-2013 school year on the right. So you can see that for the 22-23 school year, the base index has been established at 3.4%. However, again, we've been assigned an adjusted index of 4.4%. That means that we could raise taxes here by 4.4% without approval from either Pennsylvania Department of Education or from voters. Um, and what did we do last year? Last year we did zero. And what are we planning to do this year? We're hoping we did zero as well. Our goal is to do zero. But again, the inequity in the law is that we could burden our taxpayers um, to a greater extent than a wealthier school district. You can tax, just to be clear, you can tax poor people more. more that is okay with our that, officials in Harris. Right, and that, that's how you're supposed to fix your yes. budget. And, okay, <laughs> makes perfect sense. Here you can see we highlighted, again, I know it's a little difficult to see, if we called out our index in yellow versus our actual tax increase in blue at the bottom. And then we're displaying it graphically blue on each screen. Here you can see our Act 1 index. <coughs> And then our actual tax 
And that's because in those years that were higher, we took exception to the plan. Yep, so prior to 21-22, um, last year was the first year we had zero in place in a number of years. We had five years of tax increases greater than the index, again, to the exception process. Three years of tax uh, at the index, and then one year was very, very slightly. Um, in 15-16, the index was 1.9, and we had the budget of 1.9. Even still, I mean, if I understand this, and I won't correct me if I'm wrong, those, those tax increases of, say, 2.69, 2.6, 1.8. I mean, those are essentially like almost like cost of living oh. adjustments. They don't track to inflation. They're we, lower than inflation. They're lower than inflation. Yeah. Right. So just I just want everybody to be clear that like if we drew We're the if we drew the inflation line, it would be yeah. over top of everything. Correct. Right. Yeah. That doesn't mean it burdens our taxpayers any less, but just to put it in context. Right. Yeah. I'll also say. In the 2021 school year, when we raised taxes 3.3, we were up until March projecting to do a zero percent that year, and COVID blew those plans up. So these two slides, the next two slides here, talk about that new timeline and new budget process. So prior to Act One, um, majority of the budget process placed in the spring, um, school board had to approve um, just one budget. Um, typically at a mayor June meeting, um, and they had to have one public hearing. Um, Act one establishes two budget paths. This is the first path, which is often used by districts when they need a tax increase greater than the index. And you can see several budget adoptions the adoption of a preliminary budget, the adoption of a proposed final budget, and the adoption of a budget, final budget. Three formal budget votes. Um, there are a lot of other steps that, ask, that um, take place in between. These are the key steps that only take 20 minutes to get through. But from prior to Act 1, from one budget adoption to Act 1, Path 1, is three budget adoptions. Path 2 is two budget adoptions. Um, it's both final in May and the final in June. Uh, but it also comes with what we call the opt out resolution, which the board adopts. Um, I think we adopted it in December of this year, um, which really indicates an early commitment and an acknowledgement that we will not raise taxes. We did that last year too. We taken it uh, yeah. from 2019. This is just really a snapshot of the timeline. Um, the reason I included this slide is because I think it's important for everybody to understand the top is board action and the bottom is facility and finance committee activity. And the facility and finance committee is really kind of like the tool and the mechanism that our district has established to do most of the budget work. We'll talk for a couple minutes about our goals and priorities for next school year. Um, so in January, very early on, we established three budget goals. Um, the first one was to develop, to develop a budget that did not require any tax increase. Um, for the past few years, it's been to develop a budget um, within our means, within that actual index. This year, we boldly went out and said, you know what, we don't have tax increase this year. Let's not. Goal two was to develop a budget that um, increased staff in the program. Again, very new because our history here in this district had been to end up losing staff in the program. Um, again, just as out of survival and necessity. Um, so now we are completely flipping the conversation and talking about increasing staff. And then the third goal was to develop a budget that did not rely on fund balance, which is kind of like our saving your reserve, um, which we had in the past had a history of dipping into. Again, just because there was no other way to survive. But we have again made so much progress that we would like to maintain our fund balance. Um, really, it's a, it's a safety net, mm -hmm. but it's also just a strong point of accountability. These are traditional budget priorities. Um, we wrote these forward. You know, uh, these were honestly not even conversational. These were just kind of givens that um, hadn't been able to be given in the past. So in the past, when we were struggling, we would always say, oh gosh. Can we afford to keep Mount Sinai open as a full day kindergarten program? Or does it have to go back to being a part day program? Because um, full day kindergarten is not mandatory in the school. Um, so, in the past, when funding had just been a problem and raising taxes had been our 
kind of vote of our um, We would have this conversation about whether or not we were going to maintain a school based kindergarten. This year, last year, wasn't even a conversation. We know we can afford it. We know it's important. And we know it's going to be important. In addition to full day kindergarten, you know, we remain committed to making sure that we had uh, funding for adequate structural that wide range of offerings beyond the core subjects, you know, music, art, theory, history, um, things like that, manageable class sizes. Um, we are more focused than ever on making sure that our class sizes are manageable at this elementary level. We know that our ELL and special education student income uh, families, um, those programs really need adequate staffing. A lot of that is compliance, I'll be honest with you. Uh, maintaining safe, secure learning environment. And then adequately planning for facilities going into the year um, to make sure that our you know facilities are also being maintained and not being allowed to crumble uh, due to the funding constraints that we're operating under. This slide kind of tells you, you know, what has always been our challenge, you know, taxpayers, <clears throat> programming. Um, a little bit lesser of a challenge in the past few years we've been able to do some things. We've been able to implement proper tax review programs for our senior citizens. We've been able, able to limit tax increases. Um, but 10 years ago, it was a whole different conversation where we were really struggling to manage some kind of balance between the two. And it's you know, become a little bit easier. Certainly, if the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania would do their fair share, it would be a whole lot easier. We want to talk for a minute about where we spend our money, where we get our money, again, from a very broad perspective. So where we get our money here in this chart, you can see um, that we get money from the local community and from the state government, from the federal government. Um, here you can see we've highlighted the 65% of the money to fund our schools comes out of the local budget. We also are highlighting um, that for a 22.3 school year, we've got 11% coming to fund the federal government. We just want to make sure that everyone is aware that that is high. Typically, our federal revenue accounts for about 5% of our budget. Um, but we do have some one-time federal COVID relief money that we can fund. After 22-23, that trend is going to start falling off again. 24-25 is going to be back to 4 or 5 percent. And can we just highlight though that the 24 percent state funding yes. remains a constant? We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Okay. Um, this takes a closer look well, at before before we go on. I just I just think it's important for every, most people on this side of. The percentage of revenues of our revenues that come from local real estate taxes is is higher than it is if you were in say king of prussia or if you were in plymouth white marsh right that is the sort of double jeopardy or doubles sure. underestimating mm -hmm. that we that we exist that under we, exist. we have we have lower property tax we have lower property values we've, we've got, got limited we, commercial we've got base. limited commercial base right. right and we've got students that need additional supports in order to get to grade level Right, so I just want everybody to sort of be clear about the challenges that we face, right? So. Again, that deck is stacked against us. Yep. This particular chart shows you just local revenues. So, you know, we've got school taxes, we've got earned income tax, and we've got some, you know, slew of delinquent taxes. We also have some transfer tax and then some other small categories. This is really just designed to show you that 88% of our local revenue is coming from school taxes, from property tax bills, Again, not having a strong commercial base, this is coming from, you know, parents, families, you know, senior citizens. And this is homegrown revenue, um, which is, again, a burden that doesn't exist in an upper Marion Arts alone. Flipping gears, this uh, talks about where we spend our money. So this pie chart is shown by object, which, you know, we show uh, spending two different ways by object and by function. And this particular slide is about object. So you can see wages, benefits, and then you know personal, you know, professional services, supplies, equipment, debt, and other. Um, highlighting that you know the majority of our spending is on labor. Of course, you know public education is personnel driven. We need teachers, we need staffing. Um, so again, 65% of our money goes right to labor, which is why when you talk about our collective bargaining agreements. Um, we spend so much time talking about, you know, salaries and benefits, and benefit plans and retirement. Um, because so much, so much of our money is spent on, on, on labor costs. It's probably fairly consistent with other districts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
here's where we're very different from other districts. This is why I called out this particular uh, slice of the pie. Um, 21 of our percent of our money is spent on uh, category 500, which is called other professional services. Um, it includes primarily uh, tuition um, to other institutions. So it's not only charter schools, but typically private schools, um, private residential, re uh, private residential rehabilitated institutions, some of our special ed placements, um, and student transportation. The driving our high trend here is two from home charter school tuition, um, which we're planning to spend and budgeting about $14 million next year. And then uh, contracted student transportation, which we're budgeting um, to spend about $2 million next year. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about them when we get to the mandate, mandate uh, component of our budget. Um, but I just wanted to call out you know, kind of the burden of those two enormous costs. Now, some of that, that spending for contracted student transportation are students that we need to move to other facilities because they, that's where they can get the services that they really need, whether it's part of special ed or any other, yep. sort of, right? Yep. But a big chunk of that is, con is moving students to schools where their parents have opted them to go to whether they be religious schools or charter schools, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Okay. We do have a couple slides that specifically address that issue. And the charter school tuition, right, includes charter schools that are for profit. Absolutely. So there are yeah. for profit charter schools that are taking money off the top. They're not spending it on students, right? They're they're taking money off the top, giving it to consultants. Or using it advertising for so, whatever. Or, or, advertise yeah. it or, have, or, or have a big, balloon, balloon, big balloon at the Macy's Day well, parade just, just, for thirty-five thousand dollars. Just make sure we are we're clear. <laughs> Charter schools themselves may not be non have to be nonprofit. However, Mr. Dennis, to your point, there are charter schools that have agreements with for-profit management companies, which right. often take disproportionate slices of the pie. Just yes. want to be on the record: we're not calling charter schools for-profit, right. but there are for-profit management companies that. For profit management companies I, running non This mock I hear it, but again, we're, I'm going to make sure the superintendent <laughs> no, is going to be on correct. the record. We That's are correct. using <laughs> legally Thank appropriate terms. You're Thank welcome. You. I right. think that, you know, from my perspective, uh, the charter school law and the funding formula is doing that law is really a flaw. Mm -hmm. I don't think yes. necessarily the charter, yeah. the charter component or, or you know, competition mm -hmm. is bad, but the funding mechanism in the charter law correct. is what is right. just right. bad. Right. Right. If you recall, yeah. charter schools were originally supposed to be incubators, right? Mm -hmm. They were supposed to be test beds for practices that might be transferable into public institutions, right? But what they have become is a mechanism to continually defund public education. Yeah. And again, I have a few slides about charter schools. That's good because I have a few more thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so this slide takes a look at it in the other uh, manner. This is, shows expenses by function. So this is in the functions defined under PE uh, code are instructional support services, other non-instructional and debt services. And just calling out that the majority of our money is spent on those types of services. So now I really want to switch gears and talk about the challenges that exist, especially for districts like Mark County. Um, we're going to talk tonight about you know a whole slew of topics, um, but the major challenges that are being faced by all school districts include inadequate state funding, charter school tuition, underfunded mandates, and you know, teachers uh, implementing state employee retirement system burdens. Um, they just continue to perpetuate. Um, Wait till we tell you about PEACERS. <laughs> Wait till we tell you. We're going to talk about all four of these tonight, but as a result of these four huge pots of challenges, um, property taxes become you know, the resource for funding public education. And as a result, property taxes are high. I talk to property owners all the time, a lot in July and August when we all did tax bills. <laughs> we acknowledge that our taxes are high. And we encourage people to advocate for change. Again, we're looking at the start up with the retirement system. So PEACERS <coughs> stands for the Pennsylvania Public School and State Retirement System. It's a mandated system here in Pennsylvania. We have no choice. We are required to participate. We are required to contribute on behalf of all of our this shows you the mandated employer contribution rates and their historical um, impact. So you can see in the 2003-2004 school year, employer contribution increased by 10%. Jumping all the way over, next year it will be 35.2%. Hold on, wait, stop. 
So if we were, so what's happening there? Are we, we're now mandated to make up for funds that the state government has essentially taken out of the retirement fund to do other things? Well, I just hit the button and pulled up the, the next table. Right. Wow. And so if we had to, if we were going to just fund our own retirement contributions, I think that comes should come out to about four and a half or five percent of our budget annually. That's what it should be, I think right? That's like a, approximately right, right? But we're not spending four and a half, five percent of a hundred and seventy-seven million dollar budget, which would be thirty-four. Right? Well, if you, if you look at we're, wage, we're, we're not spending sure. four and a half, five percent. We're spending thirty-five sure. percent. Right? Correct. So, so every dollar in wages. So, so, Mr. Daniels, I think to your point, if we were to just for simplicity sake, let's say we spent $100 million on wages, just to keep it simple. Back in the 0304 school year, we would only have to write a check for $3.7 million to cover our contribution costs. Now, that same $100 million, we are writing a check for $35 million to cover our costs. So, the difference in just 20 years is $32 million that we now cannot spend on, on instructional programs. Because the That's state, the easiest uh, way to because the state took the funds and used them for other things. Right. And about eighty percent of our it's payments are used to fund the debt of teachers, created by our rates, benefits, and investment. And honestly, the teachers' controversy news all the time. Um, there's FBI probes. There's all kinds of. It's a train wreck. It is a train wreck. And can I just ask if, you know, th I mean, it looks like super illegal. I'm not a lawyer, I just play one on TV. <laughs> but if let's say that illegality is is found and this gets fixed, will there be any retroactive like reimbursement to all these districts that have seen these rates balloon? Yeah. We don't know, right? I don't know, but I doubt it. Okay. I doubt it. Let's be honest with you. But yeah. honestly, if they would just fix it going forward, we'd be at tremendous advantage. Right. Right now, we're just struggling. Every year, it's projected to maintain 35, 36, 37 percent. Here you can see that in 2000, uh, teachers was fully funded, and now it has an unfunded liability of $44 billion. Every year, as part of our audit process, uh, that $44 billion, the unfunded liability, is parsed out. We can tell you exactly how much of that is ours. This kind of just shows you the escalation from a, both a, from a cost perspective. You can see, you know, moving back on the left, 2003, 2004, very similar to what Mr. Garner was sharing. Our total of retirement costs for the district were $1.9 million. Um, 2021, our retirement costs were over $10 million. Uh, we are going to spend over $25 million next year on teachers, um, which is twice as much as we spent on healthcare and 14% of our spend. Certainly taking resources out of the pocket. Yeah. I want to talk a minute because reform legislation has been passed, um, but it's not doing enough. You know, there's lots of talk now about whether or not they're going to go back to the table. Um, who knows if they will or not, but Act 120 in 2010 um, was the first attempt to kind of reset the reduced benefits, increase the vesting period, and increase the normal retirement. Um, then Act 5 of 2017, this was kind of the more um, impactful reform. They moved away from the defined benefit plan um, to a defined contribution plan. Um, teachers believe that eventually that is what will save the economy. But when that happens, I don't know because our teacher contribution rates are just like the And again, redirecting. Oh boy. Wait, can I, can I, I'm sorry, can no, I just say ahead. one thing? I just, I noticed on that last screen um, that it looks like all of the legislation is aimed at workers and not at sure. fi fixing the sure. actual, rate. Right. Okay. I just, I just want to be clear though, that workers are not what got us into this mess, right? That's so this efficient. isn't, because this is an easy use to look like that I see people using to blame unions and things like, like this is not employees. Okay, I just want to be very clear that even though the legislation seems to only be directed at workers, that's not really fixing the, the root of this problem. Okay, 
So we're just penalizing really workers. So just understand the same thing happens usual. at the federal level, right? Mm -hmm. Remember back in the day, Al Gore wanted a lockbox, <laughs> right? A lockbox of social security funds. That that is that's the same problem that we mm -hmm. have here, mm -hmm. right? Instead, they raid that fund, mm -hmm. right? So exactly. that they can spend money, mm -hmm. right? Right. In other security. places, instead of funding people's retirements, you got to make it up somewhere. Right. Right. And then blame the workers and, then blame and them. reduce yeah. their the benefits retirees. or make up for the loss that you caused. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. Just want to yep. put that out there. I just don't want people blaming teachers and things like that. Oh, for... they will. No, I know, but I just want to <laughs> hear... on the record again. Yeah. <laughs> Not their fault. Right. So moving on to um, unfunded and underfunded management. So there's a lot of, you know, narrative on the screen. It's just simply if you don't know the definition of a mandate or underfunded mandate. Honestly, it's simply something, a, a law, a rule, a guide that you must comply with. It does not come with money in order to you know, fund compliance. Uh, we get uh, lots of mandates handed down from the federal government and also a whole slew of them handed down by the state government. Uh, and again, you know, we have been advocating for many years for mandate relief or a funding commitment. Either or is fine with me, yeah. just do something. Um, because here you can see this is a small sample mm -hmm. of the state federal mandate. I'll be honest with you, the reason I handed out the PSPA document to the board members is because that goes through so many more mandates in detail. And again, it's a great document, it is a resource if you're ever wondering why it's so expensive to run the North American School District. Okay. Here you can see on the screen, just again, kind of the high, highest probably price tag or highest ticket or, you know, uh, most visible mandates that are required um, to operate our businesses, you know, pension costs, transportation, ELL, you know, drug education, nursing services, special education, I've talked about in a lot of detail, um, so just put the two uh, jobs and vocations to work with. Um, foreign languaging, foreign language, um, services for homeless youth, counseling, um, PIMS, you know, alternative education, we're required to educate students in our instructional facilities, uh, educator evaluations and effectiveness, standards testing and assessment, um, you know, comprehensive planning. Those things are all mandated and all come at a cost. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of these. Um, we're going to start with talking about the special education program. The mandates from the state and federal government are underfunded by $22 million here in the North American School District. Um, we took a look at uh, the county and to identify how we compare on our yeah. scenario school district to the highest, the second highest percentage of students in special education. Um, next few slides talk about that gap that is widening between revenue and cost. Uh, so you can see dating back to 12-13 and then to 22-23. Um, so costs continue to escalate, but you can see the blue is the <laughs> revenues and shift very slowly up. Um, and again, you know, there's lots of proposals in Harrisburg to you know, provide some more funding for special education, but I'll be honest, it's just going to be a lot of cost. It definitely is uh, The gap, again, between mandated costs and reimbursement for next year's assessment. Uh, included this because I want everyone to understand when we're talking about special education, it's not just a state problem. A lot of it's a federal problem or a federal challenge. So when IDEA became law, Congress was authorized to fund up to 40% of um, costs for putting the special education. And the federal contribution is hovering around 10%. That's exactly it for my entire four years. No increases. It's talk in Washington again about whether or not they will provide funding. Next one I want to highlight and talk about is the transportation costs that uh, Daniel uh, started to talk about a little bit earlier. The gap between what we spend and what we get is an estimated eight ten million dollars for next year. As a reminder, we not only transport our own students, we transport non-public students, and we transport charter school students. We're required by law to transport students up to ten miles outside of our boundaries. Um, transport um, over hundred. Extremely complex logistical problem for us, um, especially as we move into next year where fuel prices are insane and honestly, where we're struggling with the driver shortage as well. 
Very similar to the special education slide, these are this week the education costs and they illustrate the different uh, what we spend and what we receive back from reimbursements. Um, costs have jumped nearly 52% during the same period and revenues are almost exactly. Revenue always um, covers right up to one thousand. The gap um, continues to grow, even though we mandate um, I'm going to talk for a minute about the teeny tiny amount of money that we get from the selected learners, um, even though our enrollment is exploding, and even though this is a high priority mandated thing for the government. Here you can see um, again we went to take a snapshot of the Montgomery County. Data, and we have the highest um, English language learner enrollment in the entire county. So this is 2020-21 data highlighted on the right at 1,000 students. Um, we looked at our data for the current school year, and that has jumped to 17.4% enrollment, or over um, so close to 14 million When you talk about what that means, we've got students and families speaking 35 to 40 different home languages. And yet our Title III funding from the federal government, our allocation is Our current um, staff includes one ELD coach, 31 teachers, seven pairs, nine community liaisons, and an educational Cost of the mandate and the cost of providing And here's an example of where the mandate is not necessarily is not necessarily a bad thing. Totally. Right. right. We have to educate these right. students. They deserve the, they these deserve opportunities. It, right. right. But we're being told we have to do it and they're not funded. And we're recommending to apply more positions for the 22 school year to continue to fund services really so that targeted instruction. Next few slides talk about charter schools. Um, we paid over $10 million for tuition to charter schools in 2020. Um, again, if you're not familiar with charter schools, law in Pennsylvania, um, charter schools are exempt from a lot of the mandates and statutory requirements, um, which just doesn't seem fair. Um, they are allowed to be run by um, for profit education management. Organizations. Um, we currently pay, and this is again where my kind of you know trigger goes up. Um, the law requires in the formula, the formula, there's a law in the formula that sets the tuition calculation. The tuition calculation is different every district. Everybody pays a different rate based on what we pay. So based on our 2021-2022 adopted budget, because that is the reference in the formula. We are required to spend $13,000, $13,010 for every regular education student and $34,700 for every charter coach. And if I recall, that has no relation to what those schools are actually spending. No relation. Exactly. And that is- so Even if they're getting speech therapy, it's the same as- right. So school. it's the same whether it's a brick or a cyber. And the highlighted uh, narrative on the screen really talks about that, how uh, the flaw in the special education calculation really favors charter schools and really harms us. Um, I'm sure that's just an accident. <laughs> <laughs> because it's because they've been so willing to fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it's just an so, so if I can just put uh, Mr. Daniels to your point where one of the other, one of the major flaws and one of the big asks for charter reform is that this is formula based has nothing to do with their actual cost to run a district. When we adopt a budget, we talk about our real costs, wages, materials, services. What are the real costs to educate almost 8,000 students here in the school district? They just get a blank check based on the formula. Here's, here's where this problem in the law perpetuates and gets worse, okay? I'm just gonna use our current budget, about $173 million. And we have right now a proposed final budget of $177 million. So we are saying we want to make a $4 million investment in our kids, 19 new positions, all those things. Okay. The charter schools, because of the way the law is written, 
they get a raise next year because we're trying to invest in our program. They get a share formula. So the law will drive because we're spending four million more dollars, that thirteen and that thirty-four-seven automatically go up, even if their costs don't go up a dime. Mm -hmm. And they don't pay their teachers anywhere near what we do, and their teachers work longer hours. Here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And no union. They're not allowed a union. Mm -hmm. not, com not comparable benefits. Right. And probably they don't have a retirement fund. Like no. They don't have to. They don't have to follow. But teachers I know are. Yeah, not a level fund. Right. No, right. Not at all. Not at all. And just again, as much as we're always going to do the right thing and say, we you know, and we know here in our town, we need to invest more money in our students and the supports that they have. I just always caution the board every time I say, or we come and say, we need to increase our spending, the charters win. Okay. Anything else? Unless you have any other Unless, right. And that's why, that's why getting that funding reform is vital, both in the cyber, which I know you're going to talk about in two slides, and the special ed, where it's minimally tiered out based on, Sharon, to your point. Right now, that 34000 is kind of an aggregate of all service, mm -hmm. right? A kid that gets one session and 20 minutes of speech a week does not need $34,715 to, to, to provide a free and appropriate public education. Um, that's, yeah, the governor that's the will has proposed fixing. Correct. Attempting to fix, or at least mitigating the problem with participation. Question. Sure. I remember there was a practice that we used to model Students enroll in your school, say uh, August, September, or actually July, August, or something like that. You enroll into a charter school, uh, especially a student. And then right before the official enrollment is done at their school, which is like, like October or something like mm -hmm. that, it was, mm -hmm. the student would they would say, okay, we can't, we can't, we don't have services to handle the student to meet the needs. So they send it back to the public school, but the money, mm -hmm. the thirty-four thousand, would stay, stay in, the district, right. in, in the charter school. Mm -hmm. Does that still happen? So it doesn't happen as much here. I think that's much more of a Philadelphia issue. I'll be honest with you, um, mm -hmm. because our our charters, for the most part, still have spaces available. Now, mm -hmm. Renaissance does have a waiting list, mm -hmm. um, but they are majority non-SNAP students. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, it's not pretty infrequent that they send a student back. Mm -hmm. What we find is the opposite. Um, if a student is in our schools as a regular education student, decides for whatever reason to go enroll in a charter school, um, very quickly they are identified as special education, meaning they left us regular, as regular, regular ed. Regular the first year, you know, the first month, the cost was thirteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. They are quickly identified as special education, and that tuition spike jumps to thirty four, mm -hmm. and it's typically some kind of you know minimal service level. And there's no oversight. We have no say. And they don't have to do an IEP. They do have to do an IEP, but we are not going to roll in. Right. Cynthia, I think your point, and in, in kind of back to the point that uh, you know, Mr. Daniels brought up about real cost versus the funds they take in. The charter law prevents any excess funding to be returned back to the to the to the home district. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that when you look at their uh, their financial statements, uh, which are usually a couple of years old. Uh, but I know I saw Renaissance and I saw Collegium in um, uh, in Chester County, their last two. And uh, I know, and I'll just speak to Collegiums because I, I don't remember Renaissance's off the top of my head. I know it was similar. Collegium, the last um, financial statement I saw, received I think it was fourteen million dollars in special education tuition payments from their sending districts. Their real special education cost expenditures was four million dollars. And there was no legal mechanism to return $10 million in overpayments back to the sending district. Renaissance is not that profound because Collegium is a bigger system, but Anne can speak to this. Mm -hmm. I think there was a similar finding of in the millions of dollars of overpayment in terms of formula-based tuition costs versus actual services rendered through dollars. And again, that, that, that's, a, that's a legal, it's not, right. you know, it, right. it, it's a legal mechanism that says, if they're identified, regardless of the level of service, they get 34716 from North Center Area School District. And, and if there is leftover money, which there is, as we just said, they don't have to continue to use it on special, special ed students. Like right. they don't put it away for, they can 
spend it on advertising or a bonus for their consulting company or whatever it is. Like they don't have to keep spend that extra money Not on students right. at all. Right. Okay. And honestly, there's a motive in the law for them to identify them as consultants. Right. Again, just something that needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. I mean, we've been talking about the same issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just for you know, people in the audience and you know, people that are listening in Zoom, I, I think you're hearing a, a very clear message. I want to be clear on this. We don't oppose the choice right. that parents have. Mm -hmm. The law is fundamentally flawed right. yeah. and takes money away from this district that we desperately need to educate all children. Mm -hmm. That's right. what this is about. And isn't this is not fashion or renaissance or delivering anybody. Delivering it to their students This is, th there is a problem with the law is specific with how charter schools are funded. Right. This right. will be very, very crystal clear on that. This slide again takes that kind of closer look at what's going on compared to other study, uh, and you can see that the amount is staggering um, compared to everybody else. I mean, we in 2020 were at a potential two million. The closest uh, to that was Satterton at four. We are more than double that now. So again, something that we really need help in Harrisburg. So this is what Governor Wolf, if he is proposing reform again for the 22-23 school year. Um, the first part is that he's trying to get the special education um, tuition rate uh, changed to a three-tier system, which is going to better align with the cost of actual services for seniors. And the second component is establishing that statewide cyber rate. Um, so he's proposing that all cyber tuition be available at $9,800 a year. So again, you can see that's just regenerating. Significant amount of fees, and they have done some studies um, to prove that ninety hundred dollars is more than adequate to cover the cost of the budget. Question: Who or what would Governor Wolf require in order to get this reform through? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Senior Jaramillo, because the charter law is a, an act of the legislature, it would have to be a legislative action of the uh, the General Assembly. So we're talking um, state reps, state and senators. state senators, correct? Right. <laughs> um, if both of the schools are approved, then the estimated impact to NARS on the efficiency. Tuition savings. Right. Yeah. So we're going to continue to watch all the parties get very close to the charter reform. And of course, we certainly hope that you're all having conversations um, with your elected officials. We switch gears and move on to the exciting topic of inadequate funding. <laughs> so um, we shared this exact pie chart at the beginning. Um, again, this highlights where we get our revenue some from local, some from state, some from federal. Um, again, highlighting that you know, the majority of the money is coming out of the local local community, and 24% of that pie is coming um, out of Harrisburg. And again, just you know, that over reliance on property taxes and the need for that. These are a little bit dated. The most uh, the current most current information I can find online is from the 2017-18 school year, but I'll be honest with you, it's still pretty relevant. Um, this just shows you a snapshot of how states fund public schools. Uh, highlighting here that on average, Pennsylvania funds 38% um, of cost of public schools, and there are 23 states that fund at least 20%. Those, um, <laughs> on average, in the United States, um, schools are funded at about 47%. Again, Commonwealth on average is 38%, but here we know that they're only funding or covering about 24% of our mm -hmm. costs. Um, so again, we need more uh, advocacy and more action in Harrisburg. Pennsylvania ranks 45th in the nation for funding the state share of K-12 education. We know that the system in Pennsylvania is inadequate, inequitable, and failing our, not only our students, but our, our taxpayers. 45th in the nation. 45th in the nation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Some bad company down there at the bottom. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Exactly. Um, so there are two paths to increase basic education funding. Um, right now we've got the school funding loans that we're going to talk about. 
that a little bit. And then, of course, our elected officials put all this stuff up to the plate. Um, I think we saw an estimate yesterday or today that there is uh, excess right now in Harrisburg of $13 billion. Uh, their revenues are trending way uh, higher than they ever expected. We would certainly encourage them to. Can you, re can you repeat that? Pennsylvania <laughs> revenues are trending. There is a $13 billion surplus at the state level right now. And we're talking about a state that can't properly fund right. education. So we won't, we don't need the school funding lawsuit. We just need people in Harrisburg to start paying out. They've got the money. It's not that they don't have the money. Yeah. For the first time in many years, we've got the money. Here. And just to put it on the record, the governor's budget proposal is asking for, I believe, 1.7 would fund all pieces of that and would, by one model, fully fund the fair funding formula 2016. Here you can see uh, to provide the narrative of that school funding lawsuit. So it started in 2014, um, arguing that the General Assembly failed to. Um, fulfill their constitutional obligation to provide us our artificial education. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about it at the Political Science Committee meetings this, this year. I know there are many of you that have been following it as well. Um, it really could be a turning point for public education in Pennsylvania, and really could be the tipping point where your, honestly, your level of education and your quality of education is not just what it is. That's what it is now. Um, Across Pennsylvania, uh, there's a study that shows that schools need $4.6 billion uh, to, be, to be able to make sure that that uh, playing field is level. So we, we, again, we just said they've got $13 billion in excess, $4.6 billion um, to solve this problem. The lawsuits, again, seek for a long term solution to the inadequacy of education. Just from a real quick snapshot, the timeline. 2014, this lawsuit was originally filed. It just took seven years for the trial to start. Um, closing arguments were in March, just a few months ago. Um, post trial briefs are due in July. And then when will the courts make a decision? Will the decision be appealed? Probably. Um, so when will something come out of it? And again, there's $13 million in Harrisburg right now. We don't need to wait. Don't need to wait for a court decision. We don't need to wait for an appeal. We can fix it now. Education Law Center estimates that our students are shortchanged about $4,600 annually, and that we are underfunded by $37 million. $37 million, so that would make a $177 million budget under the legislature. Uh, so when you talk about uh, basic education funding, which is really what we're focusing on in this conversation, that is the largest subsidy source that we get through the Commonwealth. Uh, funding is one of was adopted in 2016. And honestly, at that point, it was really historic that they had even adopted a funding formula because there have been so many years without a funding formula. Um, but they've only been able to distribute new money through it. Um, not to, it didn't really make any difference yet. Um, Governor Wolf, um, it has proposed a significant amount of uh, increases here you can see left to right, it kind of walks through DEF from 1516, um, three proposed for $1,600. In the current school year, 21-22, we got a significant bump under level up. Um, we got level up supplement that equals 935 First time in a long time where we have really seen an investment He is proposing another level up supplement next year as well. In 21-22, the level up supplement was $100 million. For 22-23, we proposed $300 million. To us, that supplement would mean $2.8 million for the new level. He is uh, earmarking $26 million for us. Again, a little bit of my opinion, but I, I don't think we're getting $26 million. Uh, but I do feel like that you know, the, the, the 2.8 million might be a possibility, especially considering that this has been had to use the level of supplement to last year. Um, negotiations are ongoing. I think we returned to the 
not included, and we've been shared this a few times, I'll share it a few more, we have not included any in our Google Calendar. Um, we kind of can kind of watch the activity to see whether or not it's a real responsibility. With Montgomery County Business Manager on Friday, um, nobody has included any funding in that piece of it. Harrisburg honestly has been very silent. You know, other years, you know, you kind of get a glimpse, haven't really got much update. So not a lot of confidence, uh, but I do think that, you know, um, so if we did get all 26 million, it would be, you know, $10 million, and that would be returning revenue to the flowing through the formula. What would that mean? So we, as a cabinet, we sat down and said, okay, what would that mean? Um, it would be a game changer. I, I can't even imagine, honestly, what it would mean because my entire career in RPM has been struggling districts. You know, say no, say no, say no, because we just couldn't afford to say yes, say yes, say yes. We could say yes to 70 positions. I mean, we could make this district into something to recognize. We kind of rank them for you. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to talk about, um, you really took a lead, um, the course you can see the district from the broader perspective. Some of us are in our silos and tried to make arguments for things that were important to us. And Chris kind of took all of our comments and feedback and said, okay, let's have a broad discussion about what would move us, you know, yeah. what would be the best bang and how would we move forward? Thanks, Ann. I think uh, the board in particular and the public knows I've been yelling about fair funding, I think is, well, at least as long as I've been superintendent, if not longer. <laughs> and I realized that, you know, when you look at kind of this idea that, you know, we're $13 million underfunded right now. I mean, I like Ed Law Center's number better. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I've seen, you know, looking at the governor's proposal, what you hear at Harrisburg, that we're somewhere in that ballpark of $13 million in. I kind of realized that that was intangible enough to people because, I mean, $13 million just like. What does that even mean? What does it mean? So I finally started making that tangible. $13 million buys us 70 staff positions and a tax break for our community. We Ann talked about, we, we've taxed this community into oblivion. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'd sent the board, you know, just, just since our last 0% tax increase, we have raised taxes over 30%. And, we, over and we still spend less than other districts academic spend per pupil. Correct. So let's just get that like Correct. very no, clear. Uh, that, that's an absolute fair point, Mr. Daniels. And I think when we when we looked at this in terms of even quantifying it further, what does 70 staff positions mean to us? I think Ann kind of you know hit the nail on the head. It is transformative for the children of this school district when you look at the things that are on this list. And more to the point, when you talk about the damage that the lack of fair funding has done, these are 70 positions that we currently live without that we've made, I don't wanna say excuses to do, but we've had to overcome, you look at things on this list that are things that other more affluent districts, districts that have had the means, their families and kids have enjoyed and that our kids deserve. Mm -hmm. Things like, I'm gonna go right to, I think I have it under number five. And the only reason I have it as a five is because it's a year off. A world language program in our middle schools. We have done without that because we've not been able to afford it. Mm -hmm. Find another school district in Montgomery County that doesn't have a world language opportunity in their middle schools. And you know what? You won't. Uh, I'm sorry. You know who will? Potsdam. Because they're in the same situation we are being so dramatically underfunded. Mm -hmm. Everybody else has that as an absolute lifter upper for the kids. Mm -hmm. We don't because we haven't been able to afford it. Mm -hmm. Things that you look at, you know, the top of the list, reading specialists, uh, social workers. I mean, you look at our one home and school visitor. I'm going to say that our one home and school visitor in this district who functions as a social worker for 8,000 kids. We have one. I'll honestly, I don't think six are enough, but you know what? In trying to just look at the broad scope of, of the things that we need, the $10 million could start to heal. Six to me is, you know, is one for every two schools. That, that would be such an amazing support. It helps our guidance counselors for things they take on because we have not been able to afford this. Additional music teachers, an equity officer, more guidance counselors, uh, BCBAs, um, more nurses, 
lead teachers, more instructional support, more help for our human resources. I had to put this on there for Tanya. And I said, I was like, if we get 70 more people. The list, and Tanya <laughs> goes, Chris, if we're adding 19 and we go, like, let's say this comes through, we had 89 positions. She goes, five of us can't handle this, get all this hiring done. So, and again, probably one is, is again, just being respectful of like, of, of more. Uh, the staff positions Ann and her business office have done without two positions there. A curriculum team that a district our size should have probably four, five, six curriculum supervisors. We have one director and two, add one more in that area. Um, and then again, getting into class size reduction. To me, there is an investment this year, which is again why I prioritize that lower, but what could we do with four more English language teachers to serve 1300 students and growing? Special education, regular ed. And to be honest, you know, looking, you know, I have as the last one, administrative assistance. I will dare you to say, not, not that I want to belabor the point, okay? But I will guarantee that this school district is the only one in the Commonwealth that has a superintendent and assistant superintendent who share clerical support. Because you know why? There are more other needs than Dr. Williams and I each having our own secretary. Are there sacrifices? We make a thousand percent. But I'm, you know, to me, if we get the money, sure. Can we benefit from more administrative support? 1,000%. But we've made that sacrifice so that we have more frontline support for our kids. And if you look at this list, all of it from the top is forward facing. Yeah, Webmaster's high on the list because Mr. Daniels and I talk about it all the time. Well, our website is forward facing and it needs help. We, but you we, know what? Yeah, Leo and his team of five can only do so much. Yeah. Autumn I, I harangue, he listens. I do, <laughs> but but yeah. but it's valid. Our website is 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 a, no, is, is part of the public website. face of our school district. Right. And He's Autumn nice. Hudson is one person. Yeah, you know, but this to me scratches the surface of overlooking. To me, I will call it decades mm -hmm. of harm that have been done because we have been underfunded. Um, but I also wanted to share with the board and the community that we are ready, should anybody finally decide to give us the money that we're owed. <laughs> we're ready, it is actionable. And again, this is, this is ready to go. That, you know, should it be all the 10 million that the governor's proposed? Or even if it's, let's say we get half, pie in the sky. Ann and I have a bet that we don't think it's gonna happen. But uh, let's say they come back and say 5 million. One through five gets funded that quickly that that money drops. And again, you look at all the good that we can very quickly and actionably help our students and our families with priority and with urgency to go for it. Oh, no, I, I see that look down there. I was there. like, um, <laughs> if we do one through five, I'm, I'm going to need my position to move up a little. <laughs> I was like, oh, God. I'm going to need mine at a hard three, right? <laughs> yeah. So sorry for my soapbox, but again, no, you no, guys know I'm passionate about this. But again, we, we spent a lot of time to also say, if $10 million were to drop, what would we do with it? We're ready to go. We've been ready to go. Uh, but we wanted to put this in a very tangible plan that our board and our community can know. This is not something that is a whim. This is, we, we, have, we have been ready for this and it, was, it actually felt great to put this document in paper and to sit there and again, to flesh it out a little bit and say, if we got this in dribs and drabs, which is what we're anticipating is gonna happen, we're gonna drip and drab this to death. Short of the lawsuit eventually getting settled, but Dribs and drabs is progress. Yeah. Again, it is. Right. It is. Right. No dribs and no but drabs. I mean, you know, <laughs> even this is this is this is staff. This doesn't even account for capital. Right. Correct. So, so there would still be so let's say you got 10 million, there would still be some decisions, some difficult decisions sure. to be made sure. between capital investment. Absolutely. Yeah. But but I also say, Mr. Daniels, when you look at if if we get 10 million added to our base subsidy, that is $10 million we can count on every single year, gotcha. which is why we've held off on these staffing decisions. We've done, I think, such a good job in shoring up the financial house, making transfers to our capital reserves that we will we'll be able to, I would dare say, to accelerate those plans to address, and we probably still have, what, 20 million in capital needs that we need to act on? Mm -hmm. But when we know that we can rely on Harrisburg to help take care of our staffing, we can move much more purposefully in getting all these capital needs being addressed with money that I don't want to say sitting there, but with money that we have in capital reserve now that we're, or that we have in fund balance now that we're going to feel more confident spending because we're not going to be so worried about 
what right. If the shortfall, we need to sit on this three million because of we don't know what's going to happen in Harrisburg. We better not spend it because if we want to hire reading specialists next year, we better hold some money back just in case. Where if the money comes through, we know reading specialists are paid for infinitely into the future. And you know what? Pick the capital project. One Bob and I get emailed in today. We can go take care of every pothole filled parking lot in the school district. Because <laughs> oh. Bob and I did get an email about it today. So then you pop. That's not right. a surprise. It's not a surprise at all, right? Thank, so, thank you, Ms. Rook, for letting me uh, no, pontificate I for, I don't even know how long I went. I'm good. I'm going to tag back. <laughs> so we just highlighted, you know, the number one, because there has been so much dialogue about the need for specialists that have not yet included in our community budget, because we have prioritized other things. Um, we estimated costs of reading specialists about $9 million. Um, funding options for reading specialists. And we're not going to talk a lot about this tonight because I think we're going to talk more about this additional as a minus student this week because that's really, you know, again, that mechanism that we use for budget discussion. But we could, you know, earmark new state money. We could revisit our current staffing recommendations, consider the tax increase if I don't want to. And we could use the fund balance, although it is, you know, lots would be a little controversial because it's certainly not best practice using it for a retirement question. Again, we're going to talk about reading specialists and about those funding options in a little more detail next week. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, my plug is that, you know, it's not best practice. Want to go back full circle to where we are, what the next steps are for getting our 22-23 budget uh, finally wrapped up and approved. Um, kind of walked through, you know, we adopted uh, that proposed final budget was required under Act 1 in late April. We've got the final budget scheduled for adoption on May 23rd. Again, trying to get a little bit ahead of the curve because we know we've got a you know, a lot of staffing ramp up. Um, we're going to give our HR department a full month lead on other school districts that want to adopt their budget this next week. Um, the proposed final budget did include making sure that we had met all three of our goals. The tax increase will remain at 39.204 mils, which is the second year um, without a tax increase. Again, um, talking about 19 positions, uh, we'll review them on Wednesday night for children's science as well. And making sure that we did not touch our unassigned fund balance. I'm touching that 19 just a little bit, um, but just making sure that we are really sticking to our fund balance practice and fund balance policy. Uh, staffing, just going to walk through these um, just as a review, just to make sure everybody knew what was included and where we stand. Um, we had provided the board and the committee with preliminary recommendations. Let me turn my screen off. We provided updated recommendations last month. You can see that we are recommending seven new regular education um, classroom teachers, mostly um, to address class size and to deal with enrollment um, capacity issues. Um, it includes uh, converting two LTS into two contract teachers, which is um, really making sure that we're making sure that um, kind of the bubble at Marshall Street and Muscleman, you know, aren't harmed mm -hmm. in any way. So we're responding to some of the mandated class size maximums when we do that. Special education, again, this is almost all responding to either federal or state mandates. Um, we need six new uh, contracted special education positions, two psych, two autistic teachers, and two life support teachers. Um, the one at Roosevelt had been just added last month um, after a review of very close to just as a quick point, when you talk about those mandates, uh, with the addition of one more autistic support teacher, which legally the full-time classrooms cannot have more than eight students, we are going to open our 11th, I will say that again, our 11th full-time autistic support classroom at just the elementary level next year. Uh, not to say we're a magnet, but I think people know we have a high quality program. That and that is the reputation that you hear from other areas. Uh, but, but again, I just want to, when you talk about unfunded mandates, we are, we are committing 11 staff positions to serve 88 students. A lot of expense. And not to say, again, we, we will always 1,000% do what is right. Yep. But that is a significant dollar, to, you know, for back to the point of, we're, we're being asked to take on a lot of salary, probably... 11 positions, ballpark, almost $2 million. Mr. Can you talk about, about our neediest students? It's kind of hard to choose. It is. Right. right. Yeah. Well, we're always going to do what's right and by if, our and kids. If you look at the composition of our district, 
Mm -hmm. Does the special ed budget then also include the gifted kids and their expenses? So unfortunately then even our more capable students are being shortchanged. So it's both ends of the spectrum. Because how many teachers of the gifted do we have? Is Ms. Strickland at the middle school? And I, from what I understand, our numbers of kids identified are below what we would anticipate. Because there had been a question, why are so few kids being identified I think as if gifted. You had full implementation of the universal gift screening that you would have. Mm -hmm. yes. I agree. We've talked. Yep. I know Dr. Molitor is speaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know the numbers that for my needs goes at Eisenhower are much so, lower than you would Right. So isn't that counterintuitive to everything we say as a state and as a country? Uh, I think within the, and I agree with you, Ms. Work, I think within the context of Kind of what we've been talking about when you look at our gifted teachers and how we've been able to staff it or how we've chosen to staff it what it results in is much like our special education you have teachers with maximum caseloads because of what we were able to afford and that means their ability to spend quality time with these kids is the bare legal minimum and you're going to have parents who are saying why when you are at a max caseload i think it is a fair statement to say you you are getting Right, and the IEPs yeah. become what they're not supposed to be, which is cookie cutter. Correct. Because you only have so much time as a teacher to write them and implement them. Here on the screen, this just shows staffing recommendations, recommendations outside of regular education. So again, it's those five ELD parents we talked about when we were focusing on the ELD mandates. And then we are probably requesting recommendations in the form of really a uh, that's being out of the session. Again, staffing at this point stands at uh, $30. Next year, it's about $30. Again, it's just calling out the fact that we have not included any of the new money. We'll circle back to where we are. We are back to hopefully adopting a final budget. That's kind of budget 101. <laughs> a lot. Um, Bravo, Ann. Wow. To make sure that, you know, we have not had the opportunity to really talk about some of these challenges, some of these, you know, mandates in a few years. So I wanted to kind of bring them back to the forefront of discussion. Um, it's a reminder of kind of where we are in between the landscape of our budget. Um, again, knowing that we have, you know, inflation financing, schedule on one for negative sheet, and that our goal is to adopt that final budget. Any questions and answers, changes, and whatever you, you know, we can have discussion tonight, we can have more discussion on Wednesday night. I'm all available for calls, Google me. Newsletter, whatever you want. It, is there any mechanism or plan to make some of this public in a digestible form? So all of our budget presentations are always published on our website. But that means a person's got to want to go there and take the time to read through it. Mm -hmm. Admitting what we're all like in our lives, is there anything that we can put out in? an easily digestible form merely as public information without mm -hmm. having to say, I'm going to sit down at my computer and I'm going to go on the website, which we're saying is not easily navigable. Mm -hmm. the, the key things are, uh, it's just that there's some work that needs to be done. But people have to go there and they're not going to. They're not, the average person isn't going to do that. So what I'm talking about is published in the Times Herald or put in patch or somewhere, the people who are flipping through their phones, if it's not here coming in front of your face, most of us aren't gonna look for it. 
I'm telling you, when I was a parent running around after my three kids, I didn't have time, although computers were in our infancy back then, to, <laughs> to do any of that. So it's like we have to like go around and say, here, Joe Public. But even you know, then, it doesn't. Even if that piece we did about the $10 million, about if we had this, we could fill those things in the one, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. even that would cover. Sure. Yeah. That would make a big statement for people. People mm -hmm. could look at that and say, oh, yeah, I didn't know that. You know, and exactly. This like is an what they have, that we don't have because of the funding, and mm -hmm. here's what we don't have because of state money. That that hits people hard. I think it's yes. clear, it's more concise. Yes. And people would read, they would read that. Right. I think we will, uh, we'll regroup, we'll loop in Ms. Hudson, our communication specialist, who I heard you say infographic, of which she is exceptionally skilled at. Uh, but Ms. Worth, to your point about how can we get out something that is easy to digest and understand uh, related not only to the, the whole budget process, because I think that'd be tough to boil down almost in one picture. <laughs> right. However, big... I think as we get ready to adopt 2223, we can, I think there are some, you know, even if we get out, our goals versus our deliverers versus our challenges. Mm -hmm. um, just so people know that, you know, listen, here's what we're doing. Here's what we could do, right? To your point, here's what we really could do if we were funded and we're going to keep fighting the fight. So we'll work with Ms. Hudson and uh, try to get a couple deliverables out to our community. I feel this also needs, um, I guess, some action items uh, that maybe we could request of constituents. Um, for example, I mean, for the most part, many of our state reps and state senators that service Norris Sound Area School District are on board they with, are, yeah. right. So it, it's, really, it's really more of the um, outside areas, um, some of the rural areas mm -hmm. that are serviced by reps and state senators who aren't quite on board. So I think informing any family members, any um, friends, um, any colleagues, whether it be at work or what have you, in those areas, sending the message to them to encourage them to reach out to their state senators, state reps um, on their terms. Senior Jaramillo, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I agree with you 100%. I'm working with a number of other superintendents to do that. We have been told in so many words, as Ms. Rourke said, number one, they're not in session right now. And there's this big distracting thing coming up on May 17th <laughs> um, yeah. that we were basically advised to not, not to say don't waste your time in, in mm -hmm. doing that kind of grassroots advocacy, but they said you're not going to get anywhere until after the primary. Um, that unfortunately gives us a very short window before the budget is supposed to be adopted by the state. Um, I think one of the pieces that Ann and I are hearing consistently because it is an election year they are going to get their budget passed on time because nobody is going to go into an election being blamed for state money not flowing on July 1. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you're going to see some fast and furious action between May 18th and June 30th. Um, so we, we have some things, but to your point, um, and again, I think it is worth bearing uh, exactly to reinforce to your point, representatives Bradford Webster and Briggs and Senators mm -hmm. Muth and Capaletti don't need their doors knocked down saying fight for us. They are fighting for us every single day. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to help people reach out. Uh, like you said, the, the people that are not supporting the budget proposals and the increased funding proposals right now. Uh, so we will we'll work to have those things actionable and ready after people go pull their levers on May 17th. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. This was great. And honestly, again, if you've got questions or want to have you know anything, that's we're available. Please, please we need to do out. the uh, PSBA training. Remember how bad oh. that guy was yeah, with the? I mean, we were there for like five hours listening about the budget. You were there for five hours. I bailed at like. He was the minutes. worst. I'm like, someone hire Ann to do this. Yeah, yeah. He struggled. Yeah. So Sorry, funny. not if you're listening, sir. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Constructive criticism. Uh, right. Is there any other questions, comments, discussion from board members this evening? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, on behalf of, I don't want to speak out of turn here, but Ms. Work, thank you so much for taking lead on the presentation tonight. Yes. Uh,
this is being recorded. So we will also make sure, uh, again, I think it's, you know, we're an hour and 20 minutes in. A lot of good information that I think, again, you know, even if we can maybe even bookmark some, some certain areas that we want people to, to pay attention to. Uh, I think we maybe can go through and, and pull out some timestamps to say, if you don't have the full hour and 20 or whatever, jump ahead to and watch five minutes at the 27 minute mark that would be good. to get That's this. Good. That's a good uh, idea. I think we We're can do like a highlight reel. Oh, highlight reel. Very helpful for me nice. to have more board members here. Yeah. Everybody that's not in building finance, I really appreciate the team. Mark Daniel, so we wanted to put in a pay raise for us too. <laughs> From zero to zero. zero. Well, I was gonna say, Ms. Ward, just be careful. If you raise. want a multiplier, anything times zero, unfortunately, that's is right. still zero. That's okay. That's but, okay. Uh, no, I, I do, I do want to thank our board members for taking time to join uh, a public meeting tonight. Um, in addition, again, at your high salaries that you receive, uh, any additional nights are uh, certainly at the cost of your time. Uh, I'm going to we'll open up for public comment right now. Mr. Okay. So, okay. I uh, just want to, uh, so at this point, if there's no other discussion from board, uh, we open it up for public comment. Please come up. Please. Please. Go to the microphone. Uh, absolutely. All right. See what all means. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work, so, we'll work so just in the yeah. in the interest of public comment, if you just uh, identify yourself and sure. uh, if you have any affiliation with the district, and then fire away. And it's a meeting, so. Oh, awesome. Um, hello, my name is Vincent DePaul, um, a graduate of Norristown uh, School District, uh, family in the district, uh, have a business in West Norton. Uh, called Gangster Vegan. Oh, I love oh, Gangster yeah. Vegan. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm opening up a. I'm opening up a new food truck uh, on Main Street in June. Uh, called God Feeds. It's still vegan food, uh, and we feed homeless a lot of stuff in the uh, in the community. Um, all right, cool. So I'm kind of new to this. I was uh, putting a proposal together for a grant for um, school uh, for like you know food deserts feeding people in Narstown. And I just started hitting all these numbers and things. It just really opened me up to a whole other world. So this is new to me. So forgive me if I, you know, if I'm not making any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I was I was just very interested. So I came here to see what this was about. Um, so if I have it straight, you're asking, well, your budget for next year is 177 million dollars, correct? Um, and there are 12 schools. Um, and it divides by 12 schools. Is it evenly an uh, even divide or? No, it's uh, because like you take our high school, which uh, of our, I'm just gonna ballpark 8,000 students. We're projecting almost 2,300 up there uh, next year. Okay. And as Ms. Rourke kind of talked about, we do have students um, that receive special education in our English language development uh, that just because of the intensity of their needs, uh, we probably spend more in those areas uh, for the deeper intensive services. So it's not, a lot of the numbers you'll hear when you talk about our average spending, mm. it's it's that you know we, we put it together, but it's by student. It's by student, by not student. by building. An elementary right. school, for yeah. example. Okay. So I mean, it, it, it's it's right. a lot different. In different ways. Right. All right, awesome. Um, how much, uh, or do you guys, any of you know offhand, um, how what percent of that budget is allocated to food um, meals? So we just approved our food service budget. Right. Okay. That's a separate program. Okay, awesome. Okay, awesome. Cool. Um, uh, do you know like what percent is free lunch or? All of it. All of it. Oh, they all get free lunch. All the free breakfast and lunch. Interesting. All right, cool. Um, sorry, I got a couple more. They're not hard ones. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Paul, you're helping our community learn by asking these questions. Awesome, awesome. Should. That's why I'm here. Um. Who who has the authority to raise our taxes? The board. The board. School board. Is, and anybody else besides the school board? No. Okay, cool. Um, and you said earlier they can raise the taxes as high as they want. They can raise the law change. They can raise them as high as they want. The cap. The cap. Which is mm -hmm. right okay. now about four point four. Four point four. Yeah, right. That's the max. All right, cool. Um, this year, this year's proposed, like last year was zero percent. This year's proposed is also zero. All right, cool. Um, so, so there was something interesting um, I heard, and you guys had kind of made your own little comments about it. Um, it was called struggling district, uh, and then I heard the word poor. So, I heard struggling district, poor. I was just trying. Neediest students. 
What's that? Our, our neediest students as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, I was like, what, what is the criteria to be considered a struggling district? <clears throat> and I would say I define struggling as struggling financially. And it's not that, you know, $177 million is a huge bucket of money. But I think we talk about struggling because you've heard us talk about we are not, by many research that has been done, fairly and adequately funded in our program. Okay. And most of that comes from the state level. Uh, you saw just in uh, the um, uh, PA School Works has estimated the state shortchanges $37 million. The governor's proposal says we're shortchanged at least 10. And if you put the charter funding reform, probably closer to $13 million. Okay. So when you say struggling financially, it's because we, as I talked about the 70 positions tonight, mm -hmm. we are faced every single day with decisions on the money we have. Mm -hmm. that we can't give our kids everything that they probably need and deserve mm -hmm. because we don't have the dollars to, to execute on everything that we want and need to do. And All understand right. that we have a disproportionately large number of English language learners in All our right. district. They need more resources mm -hmm. to get to grade level, and they deserve that opportunity. Okay. We also have a disproportionately large number of students living below the poverty line. Right. They deserve all of those same opportunities. I agree. In education, regardless of their zip code. And that, Mr. DePaul, when we talk about being a poor district, yeah, uh, and we're at about 73% recognizes economically disadvantaged. So seven out of every 10 of our students comes from a household that basically lives in poverty. Low income, yeah. Seven, so and, 10. seven right. and 10. All right, so struggling district only based on finances, not academia or test rates or anything. Well, the finances like are driving academic challenges. Okay. Absolutely, because we don't have the same amount of money to spend per student mm -hmm. that our neighboring districts have. Okay. That's exactly what we're talking about when we talk yeah. about, when we talk about yeah. like not right. getting the money we, we need from the state. Okay. So and I'll be honest, Mr. Paul, does our academic performance lag because of that? 100% yes. yes, it does. Okay. So we're a struggling district with the highest taxes. Correct. Yeah. Right. All right, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Correct. All right. Makes sense, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I won't bring up any tax talks. I already, I'll leave that for Facebook and parents and community. You know, everybody knows the tax stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know. But now you know why, right? Like, yes, yes. Yeah. this budget, you can see why this is. So and the real estate, and there's a whole lot of other variables yep. outside of school. And we don't have a lot of I got that part. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I know, I know that part. Out there, even at zero, we're at almost 40 mils. Go so look up what it is in mm. Upper Mary. It is probably a quarter of that. Yeah. Okay, next question. Thank you. Thank you sure. for answering my sure. question. Um, PSers, um, who gets that money? Does that go, is that like a fund for the employees? That's the for when they retire? For the Pennsylvania employment. What is it? So it like stashes money for an employer for when they retire? So our payments go to teachers. They are retiring funds. Uh -huh. So when staff retire, right. their money comes from teachers. The retire the retirement it's their retirement fund. fund. It's retirement okay, fund. interesting. And who runs Peters? Oh man, <laughs> my, I'm digging too deep. Uh, I, hey, we digging too deep. It's above our. How am I following me home yeah. tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trustees that oversees the fund, and uh, then we'll just leave it at that. All right, all right. But the teachers themselves do pay into it. It's so not it, just so it comes out of the teachers' checks, or yes. how, how is it distributed? It's so a, the, the I'm employees, uh, our employees are contributing, right? And the school district also contributes. It's like a 401k, right? Like their with versions. the matching. He serves as a version, yeah. <laughs> no, not, no. As, not as good as that. It's <laughs> our finance hey, person. I, I'll leave it for the listeners at home to do their research. Yeah, yeah. Staff members contribute as district. Okay, and, and as, the payment is decided by your three highest years' salary. Okay. Okay. So that if you have a master's and a doctorate and you're getting more money, of course. and then you take on extra duties in the last three years, which a lot of us try to do, yeah, then that's how they calculate the formula mm -hmm. for your uh, retirement. And do they take this monthly, bi-weekly? They take it out every paycheck. Every paycheck. Right. Okay. Um, and I just want to add, is because it's its own entity, when we hire people on board, we let them know that they're going to get the deduction. Mm -hmm. Very into it, yeah. variables that will lead to how much you get as an actual 
years ago, it was a benefit for myself, basically, for uh, teachers okay. to come on board. It's mm -hmm. changed, as we talked earlier. So it's not as great of a benefit anymore. But um, anyone can go onto the teacher's website and get that information. That's okay. how we direct everything. But there is so many different groups now. So you want to a lot you, of nuance. Yeah. Teachers. It makes it difficult to get from the one to the right. right. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Um, I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> These are all good questions. Uh, where can I find, uh, or can you explain um, the qualifications of special ed? And like, who makes these final decisions? Because you were talking about the charter schools and saying the kid at this school was not a uh, special ed, but when he went over here, they deemed him a special ed to get extra money for him. Um, who makes those decisions? Sure, so I, I can yep. answer that simply as I can, no. uh, when either the school itself or parent can, if they believe that their child uh, has a disability, mm -hmm. which is really what requires to qualify for special education, they can request that an evaluation be done to determine, is there a disability that impacts their ability to access the educational program? Mm -hmm. So a certified psychologist then does, you know, does testing, files a report and says either, yes, the child has a disability that needs adaptations and modifications, or they don't. Um, but again, you're relying on e first the referral from either the school or the parent. Okay. And then the determination, honestly, of one person to say, do they have a disability and does a plan have to be developed to address that disability? Mm. Then they develop what's called an IEP, which is an individualized plan mm -hmm. that says, here is what that child needs to try to address that disability. Okay. That document then determines what services they need, and, and in a lot of costs is what the costs are associated with that. If they need speech once a week, if they need, for some of our students have multiple disabilities, mm -hmm. do they need a staff member assigned to them to just do some of their basic needs? Plus being a specialized classroom, uh, occupational therapy, speech, other accommodations, uh, other accommodations mm -hmm. uh, specialized transportation. transportation. Right. So, and that really is a contract between the parent and the school district that mm -hmm. says, Here's what we collectively agree to that this child needs to have a free and appropriate public education. And that's an important part is that the, right. the, the clinical psychologist provides the evaluation, but the parents and the school district both sign off on that. Right. Is that psychologist's job in-house or out, outsourced, outhouse? That's a good question. We, 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 yeah, I mean, ours are, ours are in-house, correct. In-house, like at different schools or just one for the school uh, district? We have a district-wide team and the same thing. So like when a child leaves us, goes to a charter school, they have their own psychologist that makes that determination. Interesting. All right, cool. Um, so charter schools are non-for-profit, correct? By law, charter schools are non-for-profit public schools, correct. All right, cool. And so North Sound Area School District is a for-profit business? <laughs> no, 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 no. no, we, we, we are right. a public school district. So within the state law, public school districts are nonprofit. Uh, okay. you, you look at uh, when our budget presentation, we talk about, you know, we're proposing 177 million plus dollars expended, and we have to adopt a budget, budget that shows $177 million of revenue to spend $177 million of expenses. All right, cool. Charter schools have to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. The difference is the charter law allows those schools to contract with management companies which may be a for-profit entity. Okay. So to do some of their administrative work and some yeah. of the other things. And if they want to sit there and say, you're going to pay me whatever, I, I think we've seen some contracts, $5,000 per kid, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, we'll say a million dollar contract, but it's only going to cost us $800,000 to do that million dollars. They get to keep the $200,000 extra. And the charter law allows for that. Interesting. Thank you. I'm learning. I'm learning some cool stuff today. Um, but, but just so you know, yeah, that is, the, is, those four <laughs> management companies typically earn a lot more than $200,000. That was an illustrative example. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Don't I, get me go, Mr. Mason. I, I think, <laughs> I think that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. That, oh, I have, what's the current, what is the current cost per, uh, North Sound Area School District, uh, student, uh, something uh, when I was Googling for my report the other day, um, it said it was like $16,000 almost $17,000 per student. Is that yeah, still? It depends on if you're talking about enti like entire spend or spend yeah. on academics. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know if that number I was looking at was just on academics or overall for the whole year. It was regular and Right, so yeah. many factors and 
Well, just for the re just for the regular a regular student, you know, for a year. I think if you just say flat across the board, irregardless of special program, it's probably fifteen, sixteen thousand. Okay, cool. If you take our money and just divide by eight thousand, it's probably somewhere right around. Just assuming everybody gets equal, even though they don't get equal. All right, awesome. Um, and how many students are currently in the North Sound Area School District? Do you, do you know? Uh, we're, we're, roundabout? I think projecting we're going to be we're over seventy six hundred. No, okay. Yeah, we're going to be tickling eight thousand when we by our October mid October is our high point. We're going to be pretty close to eight thousand. That number keeps going up. The money doesn't. Right. Crazy. I'm gonna pray for you guys. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'm around. I would like to pop in time to time. However, I can help or support. Yeah. Again, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. Third and fourth Monday of the month. Third and fourth. All right, so on my calendar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it for public comment. Yeah. All right. Well, again, thank our board for taking time this evening. This work for taking lead. Cabinet for an extra night out. Thank you, everyone, that joined us via Zoom. Again, this meeting will be recorded. Uh, we'll post it on the website so that, again, we encourage people to learn about our budget. And we look forward to uh, getting our budget finalized this month. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much.